Marketing, how's everybody doing? It is Monday night, so we are back with another live session. Uh, I'm TJ. You all know Courtney. What's up, Courtney? Hey, guys. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Happy, uh, what, did, what did you say, Dancing with the Stars? Is that right? Dancing with the Stars is back. <laughs> Sorry I'm to make excited. Excited. I guess. I don't know. That's uh, all right. I'll leave you right. It's fine. And uh, Monday Night Football is on for those that are football fans. So if you're tuning in with us, we appreciate it. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing with your hectic Mondays. So uh, tonight's agenda is round two, the matchup, the rematch of the century of SEO versus PPC, where uh, Courtney is going to do her best to take some shots at me and my infallible, untouchable SEO strategy. Uh, so as, uh, as Courtney said last week, I'll remind everybody that I'm in on the joke. We're friends. We hug it out. We're all done with this. This is all in good fun, uh, to make sure everybody can, you know, see the ups and the downs, the good, the bad, and make sure make your smart decisions about which marketing strategy is right for you. So last week we talked all about why uh, PPC is terrible and Facebook advertising is the worst and you should never do it. Uh, and now tonight Courtney is going to, I don't know, scratch the surface on trying to make SEO look bad or something. I don't, I don't really know. So. So that's what I got. How about you, Courtney? What uh, what can you hit me with? Well, first, I should refresh everyone's memory that PPC totally kicked butt last week. So uh, <laughs> you got a, you got a tough you. fight ahead of you today, my friend. I'm ready to ready to box. Okay. That's you. All right. So let's dive in. So I think if I were to ask 40, 50 people, forty nine of them would say. Oh my goodness, SEO is so slow. Who has time for that? I need business now. If I'm writing a check now or I'm putting in time now, I need return now. Can you even pretend that that is not true? Nope. No, I can't. Next question. <laughs> no, that that's absolutely right. If listen, if you are a business owner, a real estate agent, somebody who is concerned about paying your rent or your mortgage tomorrow, you need business now or things are going to go badly for you. SEO is not the strategy for you. And I don't know a single SEO out there, a reputable one anyway, who would say different. Uh if they do <laughs> if they do say different, that's a problem. Um you know, they, they're wrong about that. So, yeah, no, listen, SEO is not a short-term strategy. Straight up. Uh, there are some organic things that you might consider short-term strategies, but they would be organic social, probably not organic search, uh, which is, in my book, still part of organic, but it is not part of SEO per se. Uh, so, you know, how far we take the organic thing and, and uh, go down that line, I guess we, we could fight that out too, Courtney. But uh, no, if, if you're looking for business and leads tomorrow, then SEO is not the strategy for you. This is a long-term play, and it is recommended for people who are in a place to invest in their business for the long term. Uh, you're going to want to have your ads and your funnels and your, you know, your steady uh, overnight streams of business. Have those in place already. Check that box, and then when you're comfortable with that system, now let's talk about the next system, and that's where organic comes in. Okay, so I feel like I should pause for a vocabulary lesson, right? Because if I'm if I'm a, a person who doesn't live in this world, and I'm reading and I'm researching and I'm hearing content marketing and I'm talking search engine marketing and I'm talking about social organic marketing and it, all of those things lumped together, they're, they all seem like the same thing. And if they're not the same thing, then don't they all have the same goal? Uh, you know, it seems like there's like paid and then everything else. Like, is that true? Do I have, are there things in that that I can do short term or are they all long term? Well, all right. So, so this is how far down the rabbit hole we want to go. So good question. Uh, I, you named SEO, you named content marketing, you named, I think, what was the other one that you, you listed in there? Like organic social. Organic social. Okay. So um, I would call all of those things under the umbrella of organic marketing. Uh, and I'll, I'll break that into two categories. And I think we should stop there for ease of, of kind of understanding in this one you know, live session. Um, so there's search and there's social. OK, those two go hand in hand and they do. They can fit under organic. And now, sure, there's some confusion because uh, paid can be Google search. It can be Facebook social. So paid has an, a search and a social category. So does organic. Google and everything else, right? Google and Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it. Those would all be considered social. So um, I am mostly interested, but not entirely interested, not exclusively, mostly interested in what happens when people have a question in their mind and they ask their friends, they post on their Facebook profile and they get some responses and some, some questions answered, whatever. But then they turn to the place that we all turn to when we have a real question. They type it into Google. 
I'm looking for a new house or I don't understand the real estate buying and selling process or do I really need a closing attorney or any number of these questions, Google is how they answer those questions. And Google is going to show someone's website to answer that question. Yeah, they might have what's called a featured snippet where they kind of pull out what they think is the best answer above all of those websites. But sooner or later, they're sending that visitor, that searcher to someone's website. And so the act, the, the art of SEO is trying to make sure that your website is the one that gets visitors sent to it. That Google says, you know, if you, that's a good question, random Googler. The best answer is found at Courtney's website. Go here. That's, that's SEO. That's organic search. Okay. Very long term. It takes a while. Google uh, holds all the cards. They, we play by their rules. A lot of stuff for us to talk about there. Then there's organic social. Okay. But it seems like they change those rules a lot, right? Well, sure. And actually, let me come back to that because you're absolutely right. So, all right, that'll be question number two on why uh, you think SEO is, is bad and why you're wrong about that. But we'll get back to it. So uh, under organic social, there's I have a Facebook page for my company. I have a Twitter profile for myself or for my company or both. Uh, I have a LinkedIn profile for myself and a page for my company or both. Uh, that is all stuff that I can do for free on any of these social media, social networks. That falls under organic social because it's free. I don't have to hire you, Courtney. I don't have to pay Facebook or anybody else to show my brand or my whatever. It's all free. Now, the traction is much harder. You've got an uphill battle to climb there. You know, yeah, there's some criticisms too, but tonight's call is not necessarily, I think, about uh, you know Facebook and organic social. So again, I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but at least there's the difference. If you're talking about organic, it can be search and Google, it can be social and just about everything else. That good? Gotcha. So do those social profiles in that organic standpoint even have value from a searchability standpoint? Like, can I really get traction with a Twitter feed in, on Google that I'm going to start winning business? Is that even something I should consider part of my search strategy? It is something I think you should consider part of your search strategy, but it's probably going to be a small part uh, unless you've got a big team and a lot of time and a big marketing budget or something. Uh, you know, if that's you, then yes, you should be out there. You should be everywhere. Uh, but if you're the independent agent out there and you've got to divide your precious, you know, minutes and hours uh, carefully, then making sure that your Twitter feed is just absolutely, you know, rocking. Well, maybe that's not your first priority. No. Uh, if you love Twitter the way I do and you're on there just anyway, cool. Have fun with it. Uh, yes, people can find your Twitter profile when they're searching. Now, the thing with, with organic uh, search is that it depends on what they're searching for. It depends on a number of things, about 500 plus factors uh, go into it. But, um, one of the big things is, of course, what are you searching for? So if you search for uh, real estate SEO, it is very unlikely that you're going to find my Twitter feed. That's just not the best answer to that question. So Google doesn't say, oh, you search for SEO, you should check out what TJ is live tweeting at jury duty today. No, that's not. Google doesn't care about that answer for that question. However, if you search TJ Kelly, then yeah, you might get my Twitter feed. And in fact, you do. Uh, there are a number of other TJ Kelly's out there. So Google wants to show, you know, a few others, but yes. So it depends on what you're searching for. But if somebody knows you, they met you at a conference, they saw your face on a billboard somewhere, they got your business card referred to them by a friend. If they know your name already and they Google you and your name, then something like your Facebook page or your Twitter profile or your LinkedIn profile or any of these other number of social networks are hugely valuable to you because you can have them. Maybe you have 10 of them, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, you name it on down from there. All maybe 10 of those things can take up all of the real estate on page one of when Google searches for your name. And all of those are avenues that will point those Googlers back to you and your website and the, uh, the, the content you want to show them. So organic social absolutely has a place in an SEO and a search search kind of uh, strategy, but it is probably not your first step. Set up those profiles. Use them as you want to. Use them as you think they fit into your life already, uh, but don't put all your eggs in that basket in terms in SEO terms. Just make it kind of part of what you do for your own life and your own marketing and your own business anyway. Yeah, and I got I got to give you a couple points there, TJ, because you uh, you hit a couple of my favorite subjects on both the paid and organic side, which is if you've got ten dollars and ten hours to invest, you need to establish your short term priorities and your long term priorities. Mm -hmm. Because uh, really none of these strategies are free because if they're not costing you dollars, they're costing you time. Right. So 
commit to a strategy. If that is, I'm going to own it on Twitter in my market, I'm going to dominate. I'm going to give all of my time and all of my budget to that strategy. Absolutely. You can build an empire on Twitter. Mm -hmm. If you want to spend all of your time and your dollars writing, running PPC, whatever that line is, like you said earlier in this call, TJ, commit to a strategy that's going to meet your short term goals and then layer that with the medium and long term goals. Uh, so that's kind of where this whole <laughs> duking it out between the two is a healthy, long term, sustainable business has yeah. both going on. Right. Absolutely. Right. So Absolutely. let me let me circle back to a question that I kind of threw at you in the middle of a thought there. Sorry. Okay. Uh, good grief. Every time I open up my laptop, something on Google has changed. <laughs> and I know that to be true because something that I was ranking on two months ago, I suddenly am not even on the top 10 pages. And you know, if you're not on the first couple pages, you don't exist, right? So mm -hmm. what I did was working. Google changed something on me. Now I have to go back to square one. What right. the heck? All right. So you've hit on two different things there. Number one, Google changes things all the time. You're absolutely right. Uh, the second thing that people tend to forget about is that SEO is a contest. You, this is a race for number one. It is you versus the world trying to be the best page on the internet for whatever that topic is. It is a contest and you're trying to be number one. So if you were number one and then all of a sudden you're now number two or five or 10 or whatever, it could be that Google changed something depending on how many spots you dropped. Uh, but if you drop from one to two, whoever just took over as number one just did better than you did. They're, they're beating you this week or month or quarter or whatever at the race, at the SEO contest. Uh, so don't always blame Google and their algorithm changes. You got to make sure that you're watching over your shoulder for who's number two and three and four on that list because they're gunning for you. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the old uh, cliche is that you can work as hard as you want to beat me because I'm going to work twice as hard to stay out in front. So there is a lot of strategy there. But the big thing that you're hitting on here is Google changing the rules. So you're right. That's that's true. Uh, Facebook, when they do their ad uh, you know, strategy and their ad platform and stuff, when they change the rules, they tell you because they still want you to use their platform and they want your money uh, and they want to make sure you can use it effectively. Google, they kind of tell us, but not really. Not really. They, they, they announce a couple of things when they are big or when there's like a, a massive shift uh, and they want everyone to get on board ahead of time. Classic example of this is almost a year and a half ago now, uh, the SEO industry went through what was called mobile Geddon. If you have a, a website that was built maybe a couple of years back and a web developer did it for you or something and they called you up on the phone and said, we need to redo your mobile website and we need to do it now. Uh, they weren't just blowing smoke. They weren't just trying to get your money. They did that because Google released a massive algorithm update that said, if your website is not mobile friendly, then you will not show in the search results at all when that search happens uh, from a mobile device. So on desktop, sure, you might say the same, but if I'm Googling on my iPhone, like, see you later, you're gone unless your website passes this, this rule. So that's one of the examples of Google saying, you better do this and you better do it now or you're out. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, they don't say anything of the sort. Uh, they, a couple years back, they up, maybe a couple months back, they updated their algorithm to be incrementally changed. It used to be these big waterfall dumps uh, that every year, or so they would push out these massive updates. Uh, now they do it in tiny increments and they do it with machine learning and it's not even a, most of the time, not even a human thing anymore. And it's happening on average, uh, like every 18 hours or so, 500 times a year, which comes out to be one point something times a day. Uh, so those updates are happening constantly and there is no way to know when they're coming or what's going to happen to them. And that's true. And there's nothing we can do about it. Google owns the Internet and they own the, the quest for information. And we just have to jump through their hoops. So you got me there, Courtney. There's nothing I can do except to tell you that the SEO industry knows this. We're ready for this challenge. This is part of why I get out of bed every morning. You can see how animated and fired up I get about this. I love it. So if you're looking to hire an SEO, find somebody who does their homework on Google's algorithm updates and what's smart today is probably not the same thing as what was smart five years ago, 10 years ago, maybe not even one year ago, or what will be smart in one year from now. There is a huge industry that all we do is talk about what's coming down the line of Google updates and, hey, was there an update this weekend? I don't know, what do your analytics say? I don't know, what do your analytics say? People like me geek out about this stuff. So. <laughs> 
Nerd there, is, <laughs> <laughs> there is a light at the end of this tunnel of, uh, you know, of saying, well, it's all a big mystery. Yeah, it is a mystery, but people like me get paid to make sure we can understand that mystery as closely or as, as best as possible to interpret it for, for people like you that have no idea and don't want to have any idea. That's part of what I do for a living, you know? Well, and TJ, it kind of reminds me of, I don't know if you were a Peanuts fan when you were a kid, but yeah. whenever Lucy would hold the football for Charlie Brown and then he'd come running up to it and she'd just move it. That's kind of what this sounds like to me, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Like, I except, except Lucy was, was being... I learned, I learned Facebook ads. I learned one system. And if I can keep up on the system or I have a good training program that's keeping me up to date, um, that the football doesn't move. But it's yeah. like Google moves the football without telling you that they're moving the football. Or Lucy's like, hang on, hang on, I'm, gonna, I'm about to move it. Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> Keep up, Chuck. Keep up, yeah, right? Yeah. So, I mean, and, the and difference I kinda, then. I kind of just inadvertently touched on something else. Uh, okay. So, like, okay, if you learn Facebook ads, you learn Facebook ads. Like, that skill is relatively specific to Facebook advertising. Like, if you learn that platform, that interface, you know Facebook ads. That's yeah. not something I can then go say, I can do Google PPC. Like, it's a totally different thing. But with search engines, Google is not the only fish in the pond. So I, they are, but they're also kind of <laughs> not. You know, you're talking I'm about not. YouTube as a search engine, yeah. which it is. It's, I believe it's number two after Google, right? Which, oh, yeah. ironically, uh, wide Google. margin. Yeah. So, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it feels like finding me on a mobile device seems like a, what you just said is a separate challenge from finding me on a desktop from find, like it's all of these separate things. And then on top of that, I'm duking it out with the people that are paying for advertising space. Right. Like on Facebook, if I'm paying for an ad, I get placement. I, nobody is organically getting that placement for me except their own friends. Mm -hmm. But on Google, I'm duking it out with people that are paying to be on the first page. Like how am I possibly supposed to compete TJ? I mean, really? So, okay, you're not supposed to compete with, with paid ads. Organic results and paid results are just different animals. It is apples and oranges. And, you know, Google has over the years, uh, and by the way, Jason, I see you. No, we're not talking about Bing. You can just delete that comment right off this, this thread. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can only talk about Bing if you're in, like, elder care or, like, retirement law or something because, you know, the older demographics that get a laptop handed to them that has Bing installed already and they don't know how to change it, they're the only people who use Bing, okay? Otherwise, it's Google, or I mean, we're talking about YouTube, the, but that's a different animal. So uh, in actual searches, it's Google. So um, what we're talking about, we're talking about, I forget already. I just had to insult Bing real quick, so now I'm, I lost my train of thought. Duking it out with the people that are paying for place, first page placement. Okay, so paying for first page placement. So you gotta be careful with that term because you cannot pay to rank organically. It is impossible. Uh, you can pay and hire an SEO to help you build a better quality product that is going to rank better organically. You can pay that way, kind of indirect, but you cannot pay to rank number one. What you can pay for is to rank above number one in the ads, right? And Google has over the years made those ads look more and more and more like the uh, the organic results look. They almost almost identical these days. Um, there's like a tiny little green box that says ad. And that happens for, you know, two, three or four results above the number one organic result. Uh, so you, there's nothing you can do about that. Not all searches will return ads. Some of them do, some of them don't. Obviously, the competitive ones like real estate in Boston or, you know, mesothelioma lawyer, which is the most expensive PPC campaign you could run on the Internet. Um, so that stuff obviously is going to have ads, the competitive things. But, you know, sometimes there aren't. So and we as SEOs and we as organic, uh, you know, consultants or even just the publisher and the owner of a website that is, writing on my blog or has a homepage or something. There's nothing I can do to control whether or not Google is going to run ads against the search query that I want to be ranking for. It is just out of our control. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Okay. But I mean, really? Okay. So not all agents can afford to pay an SEO specialist to handle this stuff or they write well and they want to do it themselves. Like some agents just like to write. They, it's a thing that they enjoy doing. Maybe they've done it in a former life. It's just something they want to do. Mm -hmm. They push out. Okay, so I'm running a Facebook ad. I put it out. I know within a few days if it's working or not, it needs adjustment. I write something with the intention of SEO performance. Mm -hmm. Even if it's right, it's not going to do any. It may not do anything for a few months. 
how am I possibly supposed to know if it worked if I have to wait months to do it? So then I go to write my next post. How do I know what yeah. worked and what did like that right. again with the, with the football? Like, I, yeah. I don't know. So, all right, this is not just semantics, so forgive me for this, but you just said, how do I know if it's working? It depends on how you define working. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, SEO is, is, is a means to an end. It is not a goal in and of itself. A lot of people who care about organic, uh, you know, strategies and care about SEO tend to get fixed on it and, and think that I need to rank number one. I need to rank number one. And that's all they see. It's tunnel vision. Well, all the rankings in the world do you no good. If nobody's clicking on your result because it just as doesn't answer their question or once they get on your page, there's no call to action. There's no contact form. There's no, you know, click here button. There's no way for them to now become your customer. Uh, that, by the way, is called conversion, right? Go from being a, an anonymous visitor into a lead that I've now given you my name, phone number, email address, whatever it is. Um, all the traffic in the world is meaningless if those people don't convert. So I'll get back to conversion in a second. But how you define is it working? Well, the first step. It is the first of many, but the first step in organic uh, strategies overall is traffic. Are people arriving at this page or not? Right. So in order to find that out, uh, I first need to, if you hire me as an SEO, I hire my company, do some work for you and your real estate agency or your independent agent, whatever it is. Uh, first thing I need to know is, do you have Google Analytics running on your website today? Yes or no. Or if not Google Analytics, then some of the other competitors, but that's the big one. Um, okay, if you do, how far back does your history go? I need to see it. I need to see what kind of traffic you have today. What does you know September 18th look like in 2017? What did it look like last year, the year before that? You know, Line up the same year over year type of, uh, of metrics. So once I know that, I'll know if, uh, if the work that I'm doing for you is starting to move the needle and your traffic graph is starting to trend up. OK, uh, but if you're if you bring it back to your question, you asked about I publish one thing. I write a blog post because I used to be a writer or I like writing or I want to do it myself and not pay an SEO and I'm, whatever the case may be. Uh, if you put that stuff out, the first question is, are people visiting that page? OK, so they don't have to arrive at that page by way of Google. They can arrive at that page by way of organic social paid social, your email campaign, if you're sending this out to people, uh, there are a number of ways that you can drive traffic back to that that blog post or your Insta farm page or whatever the case may be. Um, so in, in SEO terms, I realize that I, I, as the SEO, can't take credit for traffic that arrives at your blog post because you emailed it to people. That's not SEO. It's organic because it's free, but it's not SEO. So again, where do we draw the line and how do you define working? So step one is, are people arriving this page? And uh, one of the questions, in fact, you asked me this question a number of months ago now, Courtney, is if there's a huge spike in traffic to a, a blog post or a page on my website, does that in and of itself help it rank better? Does traffic improve ranks? And the answer is not necessarily. Um, it depends on how that traffic arrives there. So if I'm buying an ads and, and Google or Facebook or something else and driving traffic to that page, doesn't count. If I'm emailing it to people and they're clicking on a link in an email, doesn't count. If I post it to my Twitter or my you know, LinkedIn or something and they click on it from another, so doesn't count. The only reason traffic would count to help with your SEO is if that traffic comes in through Google. So I've kind of contradicted myself here, but I do it on purpose. You need to be driving traffic to these pages through any number of ways, email, social, paid, organic, whatever. And SEO is just has to be one of them. You have to be writing this material in, in such a way that it is going to check the SEO box in addition to converting visitors once they get there and getting opens when you send it out in an email and getting clicks from your Facebook page. There's all these different criteria that you have to hit and SEO is just on that list. It's one of the things you need to be concerned about, but it is by no means the only thing you need to be concerned about when you're writing that blog post. Yeah, I want to rewind and just restate that because I think there's a lot I there. Asked it, I asked it sincerely of you a few, like a few months back because yes. I kept seeing contradictory answers to this. Um, okay. And when I talked about it, I've seen it more supporting your response to it, which is traffic to your website is always a good thing, mm -hmm. but you're not building SEO juice by paying for traffic. Correct. So if I'm buying it, like, you know, I write this amazing blog post and I'm like, everyone needs to read this. This is epic, right? Some of those things take you weeks to write properly. Mm -hmm. You buy it, you pay, you boost a post, you whatever you're Google paying even, 
you're paying on Facebook, you're pushing it out on your blog, you're pushing it out in your email campaigns, whatever it is that you're doing that's generating that traffic. As far as your organic rankings on Google, that other traffic is not benefiting you from, it's not giving you to improve your ranking. Cause I see, I see agents and groups sometimes tell each other, run some ads and drive some traffic to it. That'll make Google happy. Okay. Um, so, that's, I, I don't see from my understanding, you're saying that that's not true, right? That's correct. It's not true. So if I run ads or whatever, just to show a spike in traffic, uh, thinking that will have a direct impact on my ranks. No, it will not have a direct impact on my ranks. It may very well have an indirect impact by way of people continuing to like retweet it or share it out on their Facebook. And now that just drives more uh, traffic. And all of this in SEO terms comes back to uh, are, are people linking to your, your blog post or your page or whatever that has a direct impact and a big one. If they publish a, you know, their blog post and they link back to yours, huge. And the second thing is if they hear about it in a group and they're like, oh, what was that thing? I forget now. And they start to Google it and they find it in Google and they click on that. That will have a direct impact. It's a small one. That, you know, Click-through rate in Google does have an impact. It's kind of small, not nearly as big as links. Um, but you know, that is the way that you know, sharing it in social groups or something or driving traffic can have an impact. If those folks then return by way of Google or tell somebody else and they come in by way of Google or something, uh, that is, is a possibility. But again, that's indirect, not a direct result. Yeah, I think the moral of that story is eyeballs on good content will always have value for you. Yes. So yes. however you are getting those eyeballs on good content, right. you're building your credibility, you're building your audience, you're building your authority. Um, there will always be value in that. You just have to look at the holistic picture and not just, is it going to get me ranked at first page? Like you, right. you nailed it on the head there. And so, so, okay. me, so oh. honestly, TJ, this all sounds super complicated. Like honestly, <laughs> talking about all of these different places that my content is going to be. I'm, you didn't even bring up, you kind of touched on linking, getting other people to post your stuff. Like, is this honestly something someone can do on their own? Can they possibly keep up as an agent that they can just be like, you know what? I'm going to dominate my market. I'm going to have a great website. I'm going to put content on it constantly. Even if they're, you know, paying somebody to do the writing on Fiverr or, where, you know, they've got an assistant writing for them, whatever it is. Is this honestly something an agent can do on their own? Because this sounds really freaking complicated. Yeah. And, you know, you and I work in a similar in similar industries. And some of the things you say, I'm like, whoa, rewind. Yeah. <laughs> say yeah. that again, because it sounds like you just dropped 34 vocabulary words that I need you to like, you know what I mean? And, and I've been around this stuff my whole career and I don't work in it the way that you do. But even some of the stuff you say, I'm like, all right. So five years ago, when I last looked at that subject, it was something completely different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's honestly something it's honestly something an agent can take on themselves and actually see any production from. I mean, it's really. Question and, and guilty as charged, it is super complicated. You're absolutely right. But the answer to your question is yes. This is something that an agent can do on their own. Now, it is not something that an agent can do on their own if they are also door knocking and cold calling and holding open houses two or three times a week and managing their own Facebook ads uh, and trying to shoot their own videos all the time. It, if you, you need to focus on one thing and set up a system to do it well, and max it out before we can move on to the other things. So if you're already dividing your time between two, three, four, five, six other marketing avenues that have your focus and your attention, then no, you will not have the amount of time and focus that a, a successful organic marketing strategy really requires. Let's be real about that. So if you are the kind of person who says, you know what, ads are important and I see the value, but I don't, I'm not that good at it or I don't really like it or something, which by the way is how I feel. I recognize the value, but it's just not for me. I would way rather hire her to do it for me. So instead, I'm going to focus on the things that I like. You've said this a number of times. If you like to write, write. If you like to take video, take video. So in my case, if you're the kind of person that likes to write and thinks that SEO and organic is, uh, is for you, great, let's talk. Here's the thing you need to be doing. You know, all the time that's blocked out in your schedule. I know you're big on, on uh, blocking out time in your schedule to do these things, right? Mm -hmm. Right? I know you are. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm talking to the agents now, Courtney. <laughs> no, so, I'm agreeing because they should be. Yeah, you, you find the time to do it. And, and, and in this case, you're going to be, you know, we've talked about having a content calendar. Plan ahead. The You know, it's September right now, so I'm already writing about Halloween and Thanksgiving, right? Uh, you, we've got this calendar in place. So you're dedicating an hour a day or two hours on uh, on Sundays if you're not doing open houses or whatever the case may be, uh, you find some time to just chip away at it. 
Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that you also like the 40 pounds of knowledge, whatever you just said a minute ago, Courtney, you need to have a pretty good understanding of what comes into play here. So just writing and hitting the publish button is not enough. There's research that goes into it, but that's true of anything. That's true of how to light yourself properly to take a good video or where to, where to buy the best boom mic or, you know, how to run a Facebook ad campaign. Uh, so like anything, you can't do it blind. You need to do some homework and some research, but I got off, uh, I was on a phone call just uh, Friday of last week with a real estate agent who uh, he's, he's absolutely crushing it in organic uh, and SEO and blogging. And this guy is, he's taken home 50 K GCI a year in organic uh, leads and, and sales that come from Google sales that come from organic, his blog posts and his pages that he's writing about his, his communities and stuff. Now I, I get it. 50 K is not going to like buy you a Maserati or something, but I mean, wouldn't you love to have an extra 50 K a year just from sitting at your laptop for a couple hours a week blogging? I mean, it is an absolute no brainer that this strategy can pay off if you're willing to give it the time that it requires. Absolutely. But how can, you know, if we're talking about months here and years, some of the things that you've said tonight, mm -hmm. how can I possibly track the ROI on that? I mean, I, a lot of agents say to me, even as an advertiser, I'm not a good writer. You know, I don't, I, I write as much as I have to in email and things, but I don't want to sit down and write. Like that strategy is not for me. Okay. So if I still want it done, I can find someone like yourself, TJ, that can do it for me. Like, you know, not a pitch for you, but that's what you do for a living, right? For, for agents and for other businesses. Yeah. So when I talk to you and you give me your number and I'm do I'm click, 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 doing, okay, this could take months. It could take years. I don't know how many leads I'm going to get for it. How are you possibly supposed to track ROI when you go to write that check for somebody? I, I mean, we're saying all eyeballs have value, but at the end of the day, eyeballs don't buy houses. People do, and I need to connect with people. Yeah. So yeah. how am I possibly supposed to calculate if I'm making a good investment with either my own time or ultimately you're paying for your time or someone else's, right? Um, how am I supposed to know if I'm going to get a solid, like if it's even worth doing or if, you know, that number is reasonable that someone's quoting me to do it? Right. It's a tough question. This is absolutely the hardest question that I have to answer from, you know, prospective clients and, you know, critics such as yourself. So you're right to ask. And, and the answer is it's tough. Yeah. The answer is it's tough. Uh, I don't have a silver bullet to be like, oh, all you need to do is this. And then your SEO is magic. It, I wish it worked that easily. It doesn't. So here's how here's how you should think of it. Number one, I have already said tonight that this is a long-term strategy, so you really only need to be investing in this. And I mean investing in a big way. There are little little things you can do in the meantime, but if you're going to invest in this in a big way, then you want to make sure that your short-term stuff is already taken care of, okay? So I'm going to assume that that's true. You have uh, funnels running, and you've already hired Courtney, and she's crushing it for you, so your leads are coming in the door, no problem. SEO then as a long-term strategy becomes the thing that in my mind as the professional in this industry can and should someday replace your advertising budget. If I buy a lead on Facebook, it's $10 today, it's going to be $10 tomorrow or more if Facebook raises the prices or the market gets more competitive or something. Uh, and that value just stays the same. That's how much it costs. In SEO, you're going to pay a lot more than $10. Guilty. Sorry. But you pay, let's call it $500 for you know some material on one part of your website, whatever it is, you pay that money and then you're done. You don't have to pay $500 ever again. And if you wait, you know, okay, we gotta wait. If you wait that time, you got a month, two months, three months, whatever it is, uh, you start getting these leads and this traffic to that post, that will run on autopilot for you forever and you don't have to pay any additional money to keep it up. So this agent that I mentioned that's making 50 K GCI in, in blogging, he's been at it for a number of years and he puts out uh, a post on his, on his blog, maybe every two weeks or maybe every month or somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, and he is absolutely dedicated to it. Um, but the investment upfront for him that he paid for, you know, a great website that can handle calls to action and can handle great looking blog posts. And he's got the infrastructure there already. Now he's investing time, sure, but it is there forever and he does not have to pay per click and pay for ad campaigns and pay for any more SEO consulting. He doesn't have to hire me or anybody else because he's got the system figured out. So how do I track the ROI? You look at the traffic that goes up, you look at the leads that come in, if you can convert them. And again, you need to be able to convert these visitors into leads. Um, you look at that number climb and you watch it year over year. So long-term, long-term, long-term. But you watch it year over year and you say, okay, I paid $500 this year and it got me five leads. Man, 100 bucks a lead, I can get that from Zillow. Why waste my time? 
Well, if you fast forward the clock by another five years, long term, long term, long term, now it just brought you five in year one, 10 in year two, 15 in year three, 20, 25. And before you know it, you're at 500 leads for $500. Yes, it takes time. I will never, you'll never hear me say that it'll happen tomorrow. It takes time. But the value that it can bring over that time will crush the, the cost you have to pay up front for, you know, pay-per-click or pay-per-lead on an internet funnel. So there's okay. a lot there. There's a lot there. And I know that it's a, a complicated answer and it requires a little bit of a leap in faith. I know that. But the value is undeniable if you can do this thing right and you have the ability to wait that long term uh, and, and set this thing up for success over a number of months or years. Hold on. Oh, I'm not done. I got I got a few more punches if you're ready to. Okay. I'm a little. I'm a little. I'm a little. Uh, get my you know round two and like you know get the guy in the corner of the boxing sweaty. ring. Sweating. I get fired up. There. I love it. I love it. So here's what. And that's why I like working with you is you're passionate about what you do. Uh, and I can throw punches at you, what you do all day in good fun and you can take it. Uh, okay. So if I'm looking for, let's pick something really general. I, I had a girlfriend that was asking me about third row seating SUVs. She's about to have another baby. She wants third row seating SUVs. So I put that in Google, the whole United States, there's a bajillion searches for that every month, right? Like that's a big thing. So if I'm someone that sells third row SUVs, it makes sense for me to invest in an SEO post because the potential click is ginormous for these huge search terms, right? So these national brands, like I, I get it, like I can get my head around that. But for a local search strategy where, you know, I know for me as an advertiser, I can see the numbers really clearly. Maybe there's 25,000 homeowners in their target market. And I want, I think I'm going to write a blog post about improving curb appeal in Downingtown, Pennsylvania. There might be like five searches a month for that in my market. So there's two questions. One, how can it be worth doing if there's only going to be five searches a month for it? And I might not even get ranked for all five of them. And second of all, how do I know which things to write about if the search, if it's so small, how do I pick? Okay, good questions. So uh, search volume, the number of times that a certain you know, query gets searched for in a month uh, is a, a known metric. We don't know in specific terms because Google likes to kind of withhold that. You know, they, they kind of generalize it. They'll tell you zero to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to whatever the next level up, and they'll give you a range. So uh, we can go into a couple of the tools out there and tell you, all right, you live in Downingtown, Pennsylvania, and I can tell you that the number of times that improving curb appeal is searched for in your area is X, and it's likely to be uh, under 100 in a month. Uh, it's pretty rare that you find something that's you know zero to 10 or one to 10 or whatever the number is there. Uh, that would be like improved curb appeal on multifamily home on X street in Downingtown, something that's really, really long and specific. That is gonna have an incredibly low uh, search volume, but the low search volume stuff doesn't scare me. And in fact, it's one of the cornerstones of a good SEO strategy for local markets like in real estate. Uh, and the reason for that is you don't have to have an overwhelming search volume, especially because we don't think in what's happening this month, we think in what's happening long term, what's happening this year versus last year. OK, so if it's 100 a month or maybe it's even 50 a month, you know, that's a pretty good number at the end of the year that 600 people just search for your thing and you rank really well. So the other thing that's important to remember with a low search volume query is that most people think like you just, uh, you know, uh, uh, you just said a minute ago and they think, well. Uh oh, I'm here. Pick up. There we go. We're back. We're back. Pick up. Okay. So most people think if it's if it's low search volume, then it's not worth my time to invest in. And therefore, it's also likely to be low competition. You're going to have a really easy time outranking everybody else when you write about a topic like this. So the odds of you ranking number one are very, very good for those type of searches. So if I were to tell you that there's 600 people that are asking a very specific, very pre-qualified sort of a question, and either you're going to answer it or your competitor down the street is gonna answer it, or maybe somebody like Zillow is gonna answer it, and you have a pretty easy, low-hanging fruit sort of an opportunity to make sure those 100, 600 questions are answered by you instead of your competitor, wouldn't you want to answer those questions? 
And hopefully the answer is yes. And so that's where writing these really low search volume, low competition SEO posts comes in handy. Okay. So the other kind of leap that goes up beyond this and stick with me, because this is where it starts to get a little complicated. One of the big factors in SEO is inbound links. We already talked about this. If people are going to blog about you or link back to you, or if you get covered in a local newspaper or something, and they're linking back to your website, huge for SEO. Okay. That's, uh, that, those are backlinks. Those are links back for, to your website from other websites. There's also interlinking, which is links from one page on your site to another page on your site, just within your website, pages that all kind of link back to each other, okay? Uh, the higher your page ranks for a given search query, the more weight any link on that page is given in Google's eyes. If I were to rank number one for the phrase real estate SEO, I don't, but someday, if I were to rank first for that and I linked out to somebody else with the phrase, I don't know, real estate Facebook ad management and linked to a bright pink website with a turtle on it, the link from my website would, would boost that recipient website being Happy Turtle, of course, would boost it much more so than if I were just, you know, Jim Bob's random blog dot biz right? A link from that website. So it's all relative. So why do I bring this up? If you can rank number one for, uh, you know, a search query that's relevant to your topic, like how to improve curb appeal in Downingtown, Pennsylvania, and I'm ranking number one for that. I'm also ranking number one for, you know, I don't know, uh, homes with a pool in Downingtown or some of these kind of more specific phrases that are local to your market. Uh, the links from those blog posts are now going to help the other pages on my website continue to rank higher and higher and higher. So every one of those blog posts that you rank that rank really easily because they're low competition are now have an indirect benefit in ranking Downingtown real estate and homes for sale in Downingtown and the big kind of money keywords. So ranking number one for these smaller phrases has a direct impact in that you've got 600 people a year coming to you for an answer that you know they're motivated and it has an indirect impact helping you rank even better and better and better and better for the big money things that everybody wants to rank for that are high competition. So there's a win-win on this thing. It is a little bit of a stretch. I know SEO is complicated, but it's a win-win on both sides of that coin. All right. All right. <laughs> so, so I think there's two things I want to say in summary on okay. this, TJ. And then obviously it's your battle, so you can, you can wrap up here. I think a big takeaway here is that both – strategies that we've talked about in the last two weeks have a lot of value and they have value in a very different way. But I think the summary is invest in education, invest in skills or invest in someone else's education and skills <laughs> and do it right because no strategy that you give five minutes to is going to work for you. Whether it's getting good at cold calling or door knocking or crushing it at open houses or any strategy in your business, the point is do it better than anybody else and it's going to work for you. So if you're, if you're feeling overwhelmed, like you don't have time to do anything, then you need to pick a, 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 an opportunity to outsource that, to sue an assistant, to someone in your market center, someone, an outsourced agency or, or service provider of some sort. Like, if you don't have time to do it, that's fine, but don't do it for five minutes and expect to get any results for it because it's not that's not how it works. There's people like TD and myself that spend all day, every day, and money and hours, and I'm a full-time Facebook advertiser, and I spend probably five to ten hours a week on personal training to keep up to date and keep current and keep my skills fresh. Like You can't expect to just throw dirt at the wall and something to stick. It's not going to happen. And the second takeaway is, and gosh, I feel like there's a theme it's brewing and rate my real estate marketing, TJ, which is make sure your real estate agent website does not suck. Make sure it doesn't suck. Get a good website. They are not that expensive anymore. Now, I know five, six years ago, almost 10 years ago now that I first started working with realtors, to get a good website, you were paying somebody five to 10 grand to build you a custom WordPress website. And every time a new something rolled out, you had to get it updated and you were spending money and then spending money and then spending money and it was a nightmare. Just doesn't have to be anymore. There are plenty of good website providers. At the very least, make sure the thing looks good. It's an investment in your business. It is a 24 hour salesperson for your business. So whether you are driving traffic there through organic social, email marketing, putting it on your business card, putting it on your sign, paid advertising, search engine app, whatever you are, 
all roads lead to home and that home is your website. And if it is terrible, it is it may not be gaining you business, but it is probably almost certainly, <laughs> probably almost certainly <laughs> losing you business because it is crappy. That's not an endorsement for any particular product. There are a lot of good ones out there and TJ and I will be happy to share who those are with you if you want to engage with us on our, on our group here. Just make sure your website doesn't suck because no matter what strategy you are using, if, if, and if it's not helping you, it's definitely hurting you. Yeah. So and just make sure your website's not terrible. It, it, whichever person you're talking to, that's we're going to make that statement to you. If your website yeah. is terrible, yeah. go take your $150 a month first, get a decent website in place, and then come talk to us. And I probably can, have that conversation can, five times a week. You could be wasting money. You like, could be wasting money. Like, big time, big time. If you are running SEO campaigns, running SEO campaigns, people got campaigns, whatever the case may be, and people land on your website and they can't use it, it doesn't load, uh, they can't find contact information, whatever the problem is, you just wasted all that time, money, and effort trying to bring that traffic to your website. So, I mean, I, I can't think, like I said, the first question I need to ask people is, uh, you know, do you have Google Analytics running? Maybe I should have said, what's your website and does it work? Maybe that's question number one. Uh, and then we'll talk about things like Google Analytics and whatever else, you know, we'll need to do. Uh, you're absolutely right. If you, if you can't, you know, if you can't convert, then traffic is useless. However, you get that traffic, and not being able to that's our new catchphrase. Big reasons is your that's problem. our new catchphrase. You okay. eyeballs don't buy houses. It, People man. buy houses. Yeah. I think that's yeah. going to be like our new tagline on the group. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, we went long tonight. Apparently, it takes you a lot of time to be able to defend search engine marketing. I mean, it, it took you like twenty more minutes to get to your point than me, so it must be harder. So I'm just saying. <laughs> Harder, harder is not just, bad. Harder and better. Fun, and I think it's really important information for agents to have so that if they're choosing a strategy, they really need all the information. Uh, and of course, TJ and, and I myself are available to you as you're doing that research process. Uh, please don't be afraid to pick our brains because we're here and that's why we use, are working in this group uh, is because we really like helping agents out. I will, so, get, I will get all flush and red in the face for you next time. Give me a call. I get animated about this stuff. I love it. I love it. I love it. Are you sure you didn't just put on a little bronzer before this call? <laughs> bronzer. You know how red I'm, 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 I'm whiter than my shirt. I know you can't tell right now. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I think we should call it a night. Thank All you right. guys that were hanging with us. Uh, we are always so happy you're hanging out with us. And you know, Jason, thanks for the comments, guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, and come pick our brands whenever you need us, folks. We're here. Good All night. Right. I can't end it. It's so embarrassing. Hey, everybody. This is me struggling to end my broadcast because my computer...